All right. Hello, all you amazing humans. Today, I have Amandeep Bizla on the show, and she brings over 25 years of on-site field experience in heavy industrial construction, civil road building, pipeline, winter drilling, open pit mining, earthworks, live process plants, SAGD sites, infrastructure, transportation, trucking, petrochemical, oil and gas um, in Alberta and British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and Washington State. Um, she's also on international projects as part of a global team in uh, safety capacity. She is super passionate about tradeswomen's rights and equal opportunities and diversity and inclusion, mentoring, um, mental health, and this has led her to pursue this career path in health and safety. So thank you so much for joining me on the show. We were just talking before we started recording about all of the the the, the, the committees that you're on and boards and all kinds of things. and um, we, we're going to list those in the show notes because it's it's an impressive list. <laughs> so thank you for all that you do with all of that, because I mean, that's, that is dedication and it's time. And, you know, I, I just, I commend you for being so involved and you're so giving of yourself and your time. So thank you for all of that. Thanks, Brandy. Thanks for having me on the show. Super excited. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's just jump in. Like, so I want to know, I always want to know, how do people get into this trade sector, especially women? So give me a little bit of a, a background as to where you kind of started and why you ended up kind of going into the trades and why that particular heavy industrial construction path. I mean, that's like, <laughs> like lots of people go into more like, you know, skilled trade sector as opposed to like heavy duty construction. So I'm just going to leave, leave it to you. Tell me, yeah. tell me about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so most people, they choose their career path. And so I would say for the majority of, um, you know, my lifespan, that that was the case. But um, fortunately enough for me, I was actually born into it, meaning that my uh, grandpa used to truck and um, he used to drive buses as well um, back in India. And then my dad started trucking. And uh, like needless to say, I was born and raised, like born into it. Um, ever since I was younger, I, I remember having like happy memories and just like sharing really fond moments with my dad, um, being in the dump trucks and just around heavy equipment on the weekends as well. Uh, he would take me to the yard. And so from there is where I developed this passion for uh, trucks and heavy equipment. So uh, most uh, um, girls would be playing with their dolls and, and their Barbies and, and I would want to play with my trucks. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was a bit of a different upbringing. Um, went to elementary and high school in East Vancouver. So I was uh, grew up in a very multicultural neighborhood, um, got to experience life from that aspect um at 18 i did get into um the government so i worked for the government for about 10 years so i worked at the the airport i worked for the solicitor general um but in the back of my mind like construction was always my happy spot and i had such an insane passion for it a love for it and um at the time i did have friends going up to fort mcmurray and they would tell me about uh, everything that was going on, all the projects, all the different job sites, and how it was very exciting, it was very lucrative, and uh, to give it a go. So I did give it a chance. Um, I bought a one-way ticket, and I went up to Fort McMurray, and um, I labored for probably the first couple of weeks once I got up there, and then I got into running heavy equipment. So I finally got in the seat, um, ran mostly trucks and dozers, and uh, from there, I I saw I would see these people on site, and they would be helping everybody out and doing some paperwork. And and I asked somebody, I'm like, who's that? And they're like, oh, that's safety. And I was like, oh, okay. I'm like, yeah, I remember doing health and safety um, for my dad's company for for trucking as well, and helping him manage and um, go through all the regulators and making sure that everything was like up to snuff. And so I looked into it and researched it a bit more. And so during the day, daytime, like I would run heavy equipment and then at night I would do all my coursework for my safety. And then days where there were, um, like there were rain days or we get, um, like rained out of the job, I would go into town and then I would finish off my courses there. Um, and then I eventually got into health and safety. So I was up in Fort McMurray for about six years. 
Um, and then they had a bit of a uh, recession and it was slow. So I returned back home. Um, I got on with the BC Construction Safety Alliance. And so I started doing that, but I was always intrigued and I always wanted to know what kind of movements and what was happening in BC in terms of tradeswomen. Um, even up in Fort Mac, like you rarely see any women. I rarely did. And so, and, and I thought to myself, where are these tradeswomen? Where is like construction? Even now there's such a shortage and there's such a push for it, but we represent as women, we represent less than, I want to say the stats, the most recent or current stats, less than 13%. So, so where are we and, and how do we go about it? So it was one of those things where I was looking for it. And then all this time, I thought to myself, you know what, I need to be part of this movement and I need to advocate. And just because I was given the opportunity and chance ever since I was younger, doesn't mean that other women necessarily had the same lived experience and can share the same story as myself. Um, Which led me looking into the ITA, which is the Industry Training Authority, uh, which led me to the BCC WIT, which is the BC Center for Women in the Trades, yeah. uh, which led me to the BC Trades Women's Society, which I'm currently a part of. Um, I'm their VP and uh, heavily invested and committed in that movement. Um, so much so that we recently, uh, seven of the 10 board um, members, we actually attended the world's largest tradeswomen um, conference in the world. And it was huge. It was just the energy and the vibe felt. Uh, it was in Vegas, uh, just happened in October. And uh, it was unreal, like the, the organization, the level of movement out there. And so it almost awakens a spirit in you. And so you take that feeling and you bring it back to BC and you're like, how am I going to make a change? How am I going to get more women involved in construction, in heavy equipment, in trucking and transport? What does that look like? Um, and what, so what, what, so what sort of seeds were, were planted or like gestating right now around that for you? Like what, what sort of popped up? If, if, if anything, like, not, not that you have to have the plan. Yeah, yeah, no, right no. Absolutely. I think there needs to be, be more advocacy. There needs to be more conversations um, w- with government officials, politicians. There needs to be some sort of collaboration. And um, we need to help facilitate that and what that looks like. And also giving space for women on job sites. Because we we had voices all this time, but it was hard to be heard, especially in a male dominated industry such as construction. And yeah. so what does that look like for us? Definitely giving us that safe space, um, addressing issues like bullying and harassment, um, even something as simple as having a porta potty on site for women. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and that was like um, some of the issues that we spoke about when we were in Vegas. Some of the conversations that we've had, um, there were lots of women down there with different stories. And um, so I, I would sit down, I would intentionally sit down with a different crowd or on a different table where I didn't know anybody. And I would listen to their stories. And um, some, some of them were pioneers um, in the States and from where they've come from to where they how far they've come and where they've made it to where they're going as well um um, I was talking to single moms where daycare was always an issue um being told that they're not welcome on site that that isn't their place um and so I really really empathize with them um and again like I feel like I just I was so blessed to have the upbringing that I did to be encouraged to be whatever I want to be and to, to do what I'm doing. Um, and I have a passion because we need to pave the way and we need to be a good role model and set an example for other young ladies, other girls, and and let them know that, Hey, you know what, there is a place for them and we need to advocate and we need to make sure that we all belong and that we're included um, and to, yeah, so again, to reiterate, having those conversations, making that safe space, advocating. So how do you, I mean, this is a loaded question. I think it's been, um, 
it's like the Achilles heel. Okay, yes, we know we need to have more conversations. We know we need more advocacy, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, specifically, what does that look like? Was there any any of that talked about or addressed at the conference? Or was it just not just the same um, factors that, we, that we've already identified, even from like 20 years ago with, you know, um, inclusivity on site and and um, child care and you know like all of the and working out like all that kind of stuff like all of those things have been identified and, and known for a really long time and it just uh, at the thing that I get I get frustrated around um, especially through a lot of these conversations I've been having on this particular season is that um, yeah we've identified all that but how do we enact how do we enact change and, and where does that come from and I think you know, from what I'm hearing and what I'm seeing, what I felt and what I'm, you know, uh, I guess just aware of is it, it needs to be a top and a top down and a bottom up approach. And having conversation is one thing, but the, the action needs to be in basically pushed out so that, you know, we we create those those containers of work environment that are wonderful for everybody. And um I don't know. I'm just wondering, like, was there anything that kind of was a, a new idea that came up at the conference that sort of sparked you? Or was it still like, we don't know exactly what needs to be done or how to make that happen. And we still know that it needs something needs to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love your point about how internally you need to um, work from the top as well as the bottom. That's an, on an internal basis externally how do we change that or how do we shift that thought process well by again going back to organizing that movement projecting that putting it out there so that other people in other organizations catch wind of that too um there needs to be some sort of government involvement and by government involvement i mean um changing policies or having these associations set such as the bc trades women's society such as bcc wit and putting it out there, advertising, making it known that, hey, you know what, there are resources or support um, that we will advocate for you, we will stand behind you. And it, it's been a long time coming, we're still not there yet, but we're at least progressing. And one step forward is better than no steps at all. Oh, or absolutely, even absolutely. Back, like, but, I'm not, I'm not criticizing uh, anything that has been done up to this point, but it just yeah. feels like was there anything new I'm like like was there anybody who had like this brilliant idea that we should all know about is kind of what I was like uh, yeah 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 um I I actually met some policy makers from uh the on a federal level so from the the U.S. government and I was very impressed to see that that there yeah. actually are um uh, people of influence there and people that will instill and create that change and and hopefully progress like more quicker than than not so much i mean did you hear uh sorry did you hear um any of like the american women or those who identify as you know um did you hear like really similar things to us here up in canada um i know we have like longer maternity leaves and all that kind of stuff and, and sometimes yeah. um you know it's not quite the same down there and and some yeah. ways it's better some ways it's not but did you sort of have the same narrative on both sides of the border I feel like we had specifically in BC, like looking at and knowing what we know, well, what I know now going down there, I feel like they don't have as many programs or like research studies, resources, support. I feel like they don't have it. And, and this conference, this specific one that I went to, uh, it's Trades Women Build Nations and it's put on by NAB2, which the acronym escapes me. So it's North American um, something trades unions, building trades unions, maybe. So it, it had a heavy uh, union presence. And right. with unions, like they're much more uh, influential, they're much more organized down there. But I found that there were some things that they were missing. So programming such as uh, the BCC WIT, they put on the regional uh, representative training which looks at like honing in on your leadership skills. Um, I actually took that training um, back in, in May and it was absolutely exceptional um, how to fine tune and write for grant proposals, for example, um, leadership skills, um, having that education around DEI, which is a newer concept as well. 
um, the verbi verbiage and terminology, uh, terminology around uh, trans people as well. So it was like very informative. So there's that, there's another program, um, it's called um, not just a, another I'm bystander. Not, yeah, not just a bystander. So I just yeah. pause for a second. Sure. For those who don't know, and I'm in that camp, what is yeah. DEI? Oh, okay. Um, so DEI is, um, it's a relatively younger, newer term. It stands for diversity, um, inclusion, and equity. So meaning that looking at okay. um, everything in terms of people from different walks, sex, creeds, having different stories, um, gender, um, genders as well, because different people identify as different genders. And there's other people that don't identify identify as um, a specific gender or they're non-binary yeah and so um yeah so there, there was like uh, education around that um when I did the regional rep program through the BCC WIT and you know I like, signed up for that thing twice and twice I had to um basically reschedule and I, okay, I, really, yeah, wanted, yeah. I really want to take it I'm really excited to take it and I, yeah hopefully the next time it comes around I'll be able to you know commit and actually go but yeah um, yeah, no, it sounds really, really amazing. You gotta go. You gotta a little go. bit of um, uh, even PR training as well. Um, yeah, yeah, there is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, stuff, absolutely. So. Like how to interact uh, with the media and having yeah. like a virtual influence and uh, your presence, what it looks like, uh, you know, on the camera and, and off the camera. And so it was really good. And so talking to these women down in the States, um, they didn't have programs like what we have here. They don't have support like the BCC WIT and the Tradeswomen Society. Um, and also a shout out to Build Together Her yes. with an H-E-R -E at the end. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it was really interesting. Um, medical as well, like they have to pay for their birth, birth control or their contraception. Um, whereas with like up here, I feel like we have, because we have universal medical care, like in Canada, I feel like we have an advantage over women in the States. Uh, even yeah. something like the naloxone kit, which I actually have in my goodie bag, <laughs> which the BCC wit, thank you very much guys, uh, gave me. And and so when I, when I was talking to people down there about it, the tradeswomen, they're, they're like, no, we have to pay for everything. Yeah. And, and so it's just one of those things where like, you just, you feel so much more supported. Um, and so, yeah, yeah. Excellent. All right. So um, I just want to circle back. I mean, the, this tangent off to about the um, that show in Vegas and everything. I, 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 I wish I could have gone, to be honest. I think it would have just been a phenomenal experience and maybe, maybe not. Right. happens every year next one yeah. in september <laughs> yeah I, I, I would love to go um so i wanted to circle back a little bit to to your experience and and i want to talk about your experience of being in fort mac and like camp life and all that kind of stuff because that's a really i don't know that's a really big thing for a lot of women to even yeah. think about doing because now we're you're going into this this community really <laughs> like predominantly men and I can see how maybe some women would be really intimidated by that or fearful around things about their safety and and you know being respected and all that kind of thing so I want to know sort of did you have any I guess misgivings around should I go should I not go and when you got there what was I guess your experience in in the way of what was <laughs> what was validated around like what you thought might be happening there and then maybe anything that was surprising um good or bad and anything that you would maybe recommend to somebody who would be considering going to a camp whether in Fort Mac or somewhere else um mm -hmm. you know tips and tricks to be able to navigate that that world so yeah yeah um so I did that for about six years so 2010 to 2016 um it's camp life is very very different it's not for the faint of heart and I'm not going to sugarcoat anything either uh there were days where I just I felt completely um very isolated and I was away from family and friends because everybody was back home in Vancouver um and and I was up there all by myself and um so yeah it, it was interesting it was a very unique uh experience I was 
uh, given a heads up and cautioned about uh, life in camp. And people ask me, would you do it again? Um, absolutely. In a heartbeat. Because at that time, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Um, Like nothing comes easy in life. Like nothing, you know, especially like being up there as well, being a woman, being a person of color. um, Like it's almost like you feel like the odds are stacked up against you, but you can't think like that. You just have to change the way you think about things and switch your mentality. So why was I there? Why is anybody up there? Well, to make money. It's super, super lucrative. And at the time I didn't have any commitments. Um, I, I, I still actually don't have any commitments. <laughs> I, think commitments. I don't have any pets, kids, partner. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So in, in that arena, I don't have a lot going on. <laughs> Um, there's still time there's still lots of time yeah 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 it was easy for me at the time um because I didn't have that and so I just kind of looked at the bigger picture and there's um a lot of great good people up there uh I I met a lot of maritimers and my god they have a heart of gold and so I I made a lot of new uh connections and uh it was really good I I felt like it was my second family like a lot of the crews that I was on too um and just depending on the camps up there as well um so there's trade camps there's camps for like management leadership um I had the opportunity of um staying in both of them and uh, I think they're doing a better job in terms of accommodating women up in camps and, you know, the, the horror stories that you hear, I'm sure they're true. Um, even based on my own personal experience. Yeah. There's times where, uh, you may have, um, men or even women, uh, approach you and, and it, it's just, it makes you feel awkward and uncomfortable. And so, um, having like allies, having people there that will support you, that will look out for you. It absolutely helps um and yeah like overall like I said I I would do it again um is it uh picture perfect absolutely not like you will come across conflicts or you will come across people trying to hit on you or take you out on dates and you just have to politely decline or like if if you want to go go for it but that that wasn't why I was there I was (laughs) up there to like work and um so I would like politely decline or even when I would go into town it was always with my crew it was in a group setting um I was always like mindful and cognizant and aware of my surroundings um and camps vary like I was at this one camp and it was for like a smaller outfit it was very um remote and so for those of you who know uh Alberta uh geographics I was in a small uh it wasn't even a town it was a hamlet um in Conklin which is just south of Fort McMurray and so I was I was there for like a number of months um and I was up um, as far as like Fort Mackay and and Fort Hills and beyond as well. And so the camps, um, like the bigger um, plants, uh, there were towns, but there were times where I was in town and and considered a townie. But for the most part, like I, I was making money, I was staying in camp, um, and so that's what I did. But um, yeah, there's like security, there's cameras. Um, it's safe for the most part. It, it's pretty good um there's so the actual yeah. the actual accommodation and yeah you know, like the bits like I'm I'm a creature of comfort so like the beds were they okay and like from yeah. a, a showering and you know yeah. perspective totally, you know, totally. all, all so, so and the, and it's not like all you know like t- totally roughing it I mean it's still no great, it's right? still it's still good it's still good yeah 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 like the beds are super comfortable they're small so, I mean, like to give uh, context, I'm 5'2 and I'm fine. I can fit on like a kid's bed just fine. Um, <laughs> I can actually still get into the ball pit at Chuck E. Cheese, which is good. So, you <laughs> 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 The beds were great. Um, I stayed in camps where they had bathrooms that were like gang bathrooms. So you have to like go out into the hall and there's like a bunch of bathrooms. And then I've stayed in camps where I had my own bathroom and typically there's Jack and Jill's now. So yeah. that's that. They have meals. Everything's provided. Um, that was my experience back then. So breakfast, lunch, dinner. 
uh, for lunch, you just paper bag lunch. Um, I put on a significant amount of weight when I first got out there because like you have to make sure that you're keeping your food uh, intake in check and uh, portions. It's all about that portion control. Uh, <laughs> but when you're up there and it's like buffet style and there's really no measurements and everything's free to boot. So you're just kind of eating all the time right. and, and you have to like retrain your brain as well. So, so there was that, let's see, food, clothing, shelter, clothing. So, um, Make sure you're, especially if you're going up to like Fort McMurray or the ter territories, make sure you're prepared. I was not prepared. Um, I, I've born and raised in Vancouver all my life. And then I spent some time on the island. And so being in Vancouver, BC, beautiful, bring cash or be beautiful British Columbia, <laughs> Canada, yeah. um, it's, uh, it, uh, it's probably like plus or minus 10, 15, if that, on any given day. Up in Fort McMurray, I've been in um, as low as minus 60, which oh. you, yeah, yeah, you Nasty. need to have, your, like, if you take away anything from this, you need to make sure you have the proper clothes. So I have a big um, Heli Hansen jackets rated for minus 100. I've got my um, work boots for working in the snow um which is also I think it's rated minus 100 at minus um I can't remember now minus maybe 40 give or take they'll actually stop work depending on the site that you're on but like I have a picture of mine which I think I sent you which if you google my name you can look it up but it's me standing at the top of a um like a stack there were tanks up there and all you see is my eyes and I'm fully clothed and I have like seven layers and I have my big jacket rated for minus 100. So um, if if you don't adjust to climate, you just, you need to like work through it. Tough yeah, enough. Yeah. Through it. And so that's one thing I learned my first, um, my first winter there was I did not have adequate clothing. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, all of that sounds, yeah, massive, massive tip <laughs> people. Bring appropriate appropriate clothing, outer yeah, wear, yeah, yeah. You know, all of that stuff because you yeah. know, I mean, be like, cold is no joke, right? Like, yeah, okay, we no, yeah, absolutely here, not all like yeah. you know, New Westy, or sorry, yeah, like I live in New West, sorry, Vancouver, right? Like you know, um, oh, it's like oh, it's like you know, two degrees out, it's so cold, but no, like up there, it's it's literally like you your skin can freeze in a matter of like yeah seven, yeah hypothermia like that, right? frostbite oh yeah. for sure just all, all, all of that is really real up there like oh, oh yeah. it's it's so real I remember like being in town and I accidentally left like my um uh, bag full of makeup my makeup bag in the car and it all froze overnight and then I also remember going swimming coming out my hair was down yeah and it <laughs> it started oh it's so bad it's so bad you have to make sure you like condition and stuff and make sure you dry it properly before you go outside yeah, yeah. Um. A, another thing is, um, like there's significant wildlife. So you just always have to be careful, be cognizant, be aware. Um, I was in this camp called Wapasu, which uh, the, the nickname is Wapatras. So it's just under 10,000. Uh, it's a 10,000 man camp, just under 10,000. And yeah. there's people everywhere, but there was like heightened security. You're fobbing in everywhere to get to like your, um, the, the certain section or part of the camp and then your wing and your floor and your room. And, um, they were really good. And then they try and organize like social nights too, sometimes. Like they'll, they would have like UFC fights and um, there's a gym there. And some of these camps, like they're pretty e equipped. Like they'll have like a movie theater, a full gym, tennis courts. Um, they'll have like a pub or restaurant or whatever it is. Right. And so you can go out there and it's like a certain level of like normal or they try and normalize scene in camp as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I don't know. It was very unique. Um, like I said, if, if you don't, I would suggest or recommend um, if you don't have any commitments, like you don't have uh, kids or a partner or whatever it is, it just, it's easier. Like, I'm not saying you can't do it. If you have a family, that's a whole different can of worms that yeah. I never experienced because I, I wasn't in a relationship. I didn't have kids. Um, but when I was up there, I was flying solo. It was easy. And uh, just banking all my money and just being smart, being smart with all of my spending. Because at the end of the day, like I've seen a lot of guys in my cruise, um, they'll make like 
massive amounts, these copious amounts of money, but then they don't know how to save or they'll just like bad habits, gamble it away or go into town or whatever it is. Right. So it's not how much you make, it's how much you save as well. So pick up and, and I wish they taught us this stuff in high school. They didn't, but um, finances, financial literacy, like when it comes down to it, you need to understand and have your money work for you. So whether it's saving some from your paycheck, investing, whatever it is. Um, Luckily for me, like I had immigrant parents that came over from India um, back in the 60s, 70s. So I got to really see how they managed their money and and how they kind of operated and made it happen. But again, not everybody has that opportunity or chance. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, I I tell everybody, I mean, we've talked about it with our kids about get a financial planner. Like if you don't know what you're like, I don't know, like we didn't grow up being fully financially illiterate. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. we get the idea of 10% savings and 10% for charity and, you know, blah, 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 live within your means, all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. you know, to really understand how money as a vehicle works and how yeah. you make it work for you is yeah. a whole other thing. <laughs> that, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. you could like people spend years becoming really adept at oh, understanding sure. how all that works. And, and yeah, go and you find somebody like when you're, yeah. When you're I don't know well, how it is. You, get, you hire a plumber with. Oh, totally. You want, you want to to plumber. If you have a bank account, you have access to those services. You can go and talk to the financial advisor because I saw like, God knows how many people I saw. So when I was there, the average 18 year old, you can, you don't even have to graduate high school. Like you could be like a labor on site, making a hundred thousand dollars a year. And like they would spend. And so you you have all the fancy cars and boats and this and that, and you're living lavishly, which is fine. That's totally cool. But you need to learn how to manage your money um, and save some for a rainy day because like everything doesn't last forever. Projects, sites, which I, I had to learn very quickly. Um, everything has a lifespan. You're building yeah. roads, you're building whatever it is, right? And so you have to go on, but you have to learn how to manage your money. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, so now that, you know, you, you've, you started off actually in camps and, and, you know, f- physically doing the work and driving and big trucks and all that kind of stuff, which I think is a frick amazing. Um, mm-hmm. and, and then you, like, like you say, you, you sort of evolved into health and safety. So yeah. where do you think you're going to go now with where you're at? I know that, um, you know, there's been some changes in your life recently, but, yeah. Are, are you still looking to, to stay within the health and safety sector? Are you thinking that you Absolutely. want to be open to other, other avenues, other things, maybe elevate and get paid for a, a paid role of, you know, advocacy and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, as much as I do like a lot of philanthropy work and I sit on um, boards and committees, I, I don't know, like I, I want to, do it I I do it out of the goodness of my heart right now and because I have such an insane passion for it but if I was approached by uh, an organization or a group or even the government um, to come on full-time and and do that I would definitely give it consideration Um, I love health and safety I love what I do Um, if I had an opportunity to go back to camp or other provinces um i i would i I would definitely consider it again um yeah i'm not sure it's a great question i don't know (laughs) well i mean and and honestly it's okay it's okay to not know yeah what you know five years looks like from now yeah yeah i feel like i've just i've done so much in my life and i and i have like this vast amount of experience and and knowledge and now i want to share that like I do a lot of coaching and mentoring as well um so there's different um programs so such as safe gen in in uh, Alberta so that's put on through the uh ACSA which is the Alberta Construction Safety Association and they have a regional um safety committee that that I work through so I do presentations on safety there um I have a close working relationship with the heavy equipment operator program that the uh, Abbotsford School District puts on. Um, I've also pr- presented at the Heavy Metal Rocks, like up in Northern uh, BC as well. So I do like a lot of that. Um, the ITA, the BCC WIT, um, they have programs in place where 
Um, sometimes I'll, I'll have like a mentee or somebody reach out to me by email or telephone call. And like, I love to get those calls and it just, it feels really rewarding. And Mm -hmm. I feel like the feeling that I get from that, like money can't buy that. But yeah. if I was asked to, if I was approached by like an organization or a government body uh, where they wanted me to come on full time and, and I can use all my knowledge and my experience, absolutely. Like I, I would, I would, if I can make some sort of difference or um, like a change, especially for women's rights and, and trades women um, and just youth overall in high schools having new and young workers come on board, like they need to be educated. Uh, going back to my original um, story of when I was growing up, I was at an advantage and I had a benefit because my dad was in the trades and he taught me everything that he knew. Um, and he was always very safe. He was conscious. He was super cognizant. Um, and so he taught me all of that. And I just, I didn't, as a kid, you don't think about it, but you think about it when you get older, especially if, you know, once you get in, into your teens and your adulthood. And, and I was like, man, th- th- there was a reason he was telling me to make sure that you check out your vehicle before you get in the, the driver's side. And then you, you start driving your vehicle. And I still do that. I still do. Like anytime I approach my vehicle or like I take a quick look around and make sure that it's all good. Um, I ride motorcycles as well. So I'll always make sure that my bike's Um, good. And because there's only two points of contact between you and the ground and um, making sure that it's good and, and do a informal pre-trip inspection before I get (laughs) going. Right. Um, And that's all built into your subconscious. And how do you get there? You need to have these coaches, mentors, parents, whoever it is in place. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, we're all a product of our our, our environment and our experience, right? So yeah. um, for you to have had the environment where, you know, A, you were supported and actually, well, just encouraged yeah, yeah. to take a, a pathway that maybe other people wouldn't be, I mean, as one thing by your family, especially being um, an, an immigrant family where, all, you know, we have many stories of people saying, no, don't do what I'm doing. You need to go to you know, university and be a doctor or whatever, like oftentimes yeah, yeah. This, this pressure to be a certain thing because you know, we all want this like American dream type of idea, right? And Lawyer, we doctor, engineer, any Indian parent will tell you that. <laughs> yeah. and, and, we want, and we want better better for our our, our kids than we yeah. have. Oh yeah, totally. Like that, right? But that's like, go get a good, good government job. And uh, and then I ended up doing what I'm doing now and they're still accepting the, they're totally, they're good. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then of course, like your environment was, such that you know your dad was um you know teaching you along the way yeah without yeah. even really probably knowing like I don't maybe he did set out to, to teach you that but maybe it was just like he's just talking to his daughter talking about yeah. what he does all the day all like you know like all that kind of stuff and just sharing. yeah yeah <laughs> and then you know you just you know that becomes part of your DNA at a cellular level right just yeah to know all that kind of stuff so I I, I love the fact that you know you, you came from an environment where it was encouraged and and then here you are so um, I always like to ask to you, um, what, what has being in, in trades um, done for you like personally? And, and I, a lot of the answers that I get on this are around just really feeling empowered and, and all that kind of thing. Are, is that something that sort of you feel as well? Or is there something else outside of, outside of that that yeah. maybe be a, a different answer? Um, it's definitely set me up for the life that I have now. Um, a personal passion of mine is, is travel. Like I uh, love to travel, love it. It just totally like, that is, that's my jam. (laughs) (laughs) So from like a financial standpoint, yeah, absolutely. Like it set me up and, and I was pretty good. Um, personally, like it's very empowering. Like you feel like such a strong individual, especially doing what you're doing and not very many people are doing it. And like having that level of respect. Yeah. Um, it's given me the, I don't know. I, I don't want to say ability. Ability is not the right word. Um, I would say it's given me opportunity and it's opened up doors for me. Um, I sit at tables where I wouldn't have had the opportunity had I not been in the trades or had I not been doing health and safety. Um, it's actually opened my eyes to, to a lot of things. 
Um, one of the things my parents taught me and having like just being examples of it was being humble. Um, I grew up in an immigrant house. I, I never learned how to speak English till I was six years old. So um, ESL. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the, the thing that you touched on there, which I think is really interesting, is yeah. I mean, we're 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 in an arena where most people a they don't have any skills to, in that area to begin with. Yeah. And B, we're having conversations. You know, especially if you know we go down to trade shows and and we're part of different you know boards and and things around you know um, advocacy work and all that kind of thing. Yeah. And, you're having these conversations that that fire your brain and you wouldn't have that opportunity to have those conversations to like get your brain to fire and and have these really interesting conversations with different stakeholders different points of view um you know if you're just punching a clock somewhere like you're not you're not having those kinds of like intellectual stimulations yeah. and i think that's something that um that nobody's even talked about before. So I, I love that you mentioned that because yeah, I, yeah, for sure. I mean, sure. I've, I've That's been on um, projects before where there's people there, there's, if we talk about um, like education academics, there's been um, projects where I've sat at tables where there was high school dropouts. And then there were people that had their masters their PhD, um, like highly decorated engineers and so it was really interesting to come together. Um, I've been on projects where I had the most brightest, smartest superintendents. Um, again, they were high school dropouts, but they were so, so smart. Like there's book smart and street smart, and they were on point and very intellectual, uh, which leads me to my next point. So I myself, I was um, a university dropout. So I was um, up at SFU third year when I dropped out. I had a lot of stuff going on at that time in my personal life. And I tried going back one time. So that never uh, worked out. So in 2018, I'm just looking at all my certificates right now. <laughs> 2018, actually, I went back to school after like 14 years and I finally finished off my bachelor's degree. Oh, and congratulations. Yeah, That's thanks, amazing. thanks. Thank you. I, I was a mature adult because I was yes. I was the same age as my profs and my classmates, they were like old enough to be my kids. So like ageism, like sat in my mind the first semester and I was like, I need to like push this out and, and I'll be fine. And so it opened up doors and I think subconsciously, like I felt like I was... I, I was feeling a bit insecure, even mm -hmm. though like, and um, it's, I, I just had this conversation with an, another co colleague of mine, but um, women feel imposter syndrome. A yeah, lot of yeah. times men will apply to these jobs where they don't even have a chance. They don't have the qualifications yep. or credentials. Whereas with women, we'll have all the qualifications, credentials, we'll have everything for it, but we still don't apply. Yeah. And like, why is that? Why? Yeah. And um so yeah, and it, it's just, yeah, one of those things. So now that I have my undergrad done, I can look towards like getting my master's degree or like moving forward. And um, even at the time, like when I got my bachelor's degree, I didn't need it, but it, it turned from an academic goal to a personal goal. Mm -hmm. And so I got it done, super proud of myself. I was like, oh my God, I, I did it. Oh, you should uh, be. Yeah. yeah, thanks, thanks. All the while, you know, I was still working full time. I was consulting um had a mortgage and I'm like okay I can make this happen so you just you know whatever you put your mind to like you can get it done and I feel like women are very resilient because we were, be. yeah we have to be we have to be yeah. for the longest time we were always told that we never had a place at the table we never had a place on a construction job site but no longer does that narrative exist no. because we have just as much um right to be there as our male counterparts yeah absolutely absolutely uh, yeah and i think m more and more that narrative is starting to die away um just as you know generally generationally as you know we uh, move through time and there's there was less of that at a, at a base level in society and in our culture 
Yeah. When we were in high school or when we were, you know, growing up and then even less of it, like now for my own kids and, and less things around how you identify a, from a, a gender perspective or not or whatever. And yeah, and, yeah absolutely. You know, and, and I remember being talking about, school. you know, what are our pronouns and whatever, like, yeah. like yeah, why, are we, why are we even talking about this is like, a, like the older generation are like, what, what, yeah. what is this? And for them, they're like, yeah, well, whatever. It's not, not a big deal. And you know, if it makes somebody else feel more comfortable, like so it's going off my nose and they don't really think anything of it. It's just, it just is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so all, all of these things I think are, are gradually going to help the culture um, on in trade and in society in general yeah. um, to, to start moving that needle in a more, um, I don't know, just a more significant way. And it's not going to oh, be for a- sure shifting that pendulum. Um, yeah. I, I was going to say even in high school. So like in high school, we weren't really, I wasn't given the option. There was home ec and then there was uh, like mechanics trades and yeah. they would always put, the boys into the yep. mechanics and trades and then all the girls would go into home ec yep and it's like well why what, what if you want to have a guy that wants to learn how to bake yeah or, or do okay. things in yeah. home ec like sew and stuff and what what if you want a girl to get into the trades right um yeah, yeah. again we, we need to like normalize women in trades and, yeah. and we and need I, to I mean, encourage them I, I yeah I absolutely agree and I do see that a little bit um even at my kids' high school, um, in a couple of the earlier grades, eight, nine, whatever, everybody has to take everything. So oh. they all took cooking, they all took cooking, they all took sewing, like they all had to do everything. Nice. And then as you yeah. go through, you can pick and choose your options a little bit more, but yeah, everybody yeah. had to be exposed to it yeah. in, its, in, in, in its entirety. Like, so yeah. all of the things. And I thought that was great policy at the education level. Um, yeah. at the high school level just so that people can be exposed to stuff because if you don't oh, for sure. you're not exposed to it how can you even know if you might like it yeah exactly exactly right. and a lot of it is life skills like yeah, absolutely your tire for example my, my dad tire. taught me like I was I actually had a flat tire so he drove all the way out to me and he didn't change it for me he told me how to do it nice so he's like you put the jack here and this is what you do next and like it, it was a step-by-step -step procedure <laughs> but that's how you like, learn yeah no it sounds like you have a wonderful dad yeah uh, oh yeah yeah he's so, oh, okay he's so now, now that now that we're talking a little bit about you know changing tire and all obviously we need tools for that so we're I'm coming to the end of the show now and I always like to ask people what's your favorite tool that, that you like to use or that oh, you'd have cool. used oh um so like in my profession, being a heavy equipment operator, we don't really have very many tools, like depending on what kind of job you're on. Like um, I remember I had to grease my some of my equipment. So the grease gun, um, okay. but what know. would be my favorite tool in the trades? I don't know, maybe like an X-Acto knife because it it's got me out of a, like a lot of binds before. <laughs> There you go. Perfect. There's, there's no, there's no right answer here. There's no right answer. Here. <laughs> no. Um, I, yeah, no, that's great. I've had all kinds of answers. I don't know. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, so the very last thing I want to ask you is, do you have any sage advice for women or, or anybody else for that matter, who's maybe considering a, a career in the trades or going up to camps or, you know, heavy equipment um, operators, like it, any, anything that you would say, hey, you just make sure that you tick this box and this box. Any, yeah, anything? yeah. Um, I would say keep an open mind. And there's lots of trades that you can get into. There's lots of parts of the world that you can go to. Um, it gives you lots of opportunity to have like a good life as well. Uh, when you're looking at your occupation and profession, try not to rule anything out before mm. you've experienced it, witnessed yeah. it, talk to people, have people share their stories. Um, and yeah, yeah, be courageous and, and resilient to, to take that next step. Um, challenge what you know, uh, always grow and develop. Yes. Um, yeah, always, you, always put your hand up for the next thing. Yeah, yeah, always, always keep going. going. For, keep for, going keep for moving growth. forward yeah. and um you know even with me and my personal and professional development I still go to 
workshops, classes, seminars. I'm always constantly learning new things. So whether it's listening to audiobooks, going on YouTube, talking to people, um, a lot of people have that lived experience and that knowledge and just hone in, tap into that um, network as well. Put yourself out there and, and be vulnerable. When I say be vulnerable, be vulnerable to like new experiences and have those awkward, uncomfortable conversations, right? And um, yeah. just be your true, genuine, authentic self. Never, never betray yourself. Um, and especially when I was in camp as well, like you have to have, take care of yourself, your mental health, um, hone in on that self-care, whatever that looks like, but be your own cheerleader be your own number one be your own best friend um at the end of the day you'll, you'll never feel alone if you know that you have you oh and you, that's, you owe that, it to yourself. that is an amazing way to end off the show <laughs> <laughs> you owe it to yourself <laughs> uh, yes oh my goodness i'm deep thank you so much for being on today this has yeah. been a fabulous conversation and you're so bubbly oh. and i just i can just feel like the the positivity coming off of you through the screen and I just you know just keep going and, and I I would love to circle back and know more what you're doing as you move forward because I know you're yeah. in, a, in a place where you might be looking to change things up a little bit and yeah, for um, sure. you know thanks for I can't, having me Thank you're you. so welcome you're so welcome yeah, yeah and if anybody ever wants to reach out to me um you can definitely like grab my contact information yeah we'll put it in the Google we'll put me, stuff in the, in the in the show notes and, and all that kind of thing. But yeah. and again, I just, I just want to double down on saying thank you for all the work that you do for ad the advocacy um, for women in trades. And um, for those of you who are listening, uh, you know, keep it real and keep that mindset sharp. And really thanks for being here. I really appreciate it. And be sure to check out all the other episodes in this series as well as all the other ones. And um, until next time, just keep being a badass in whatever trade that you're in.